Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Nicole Freeman, and I'm the Director of Education at the Holocaust Memorial Miami Beach. On behalf of the Holocaust Memorial, I would like to thank you all for joining us tonight for the first lecture in our three-part series on women in the Holocaust. Over the next month, we will explore various aspects of women's unique experiences in concentration camps, ghettos, and resistance during the Holocaust. Dr. Michael Berenbaum begins the series tonight with a fascinating presentation on the phenomenon known as Camp Schwesters or Sisters. Then on Monday, March 20th, Dr. Berenbaum will be joined by historian Dr. Zoe Waxman, who is the author of Women in the Holocaust of Feminist History. The series then concludes on Monday, March 27th with a lecture on Jewish women in the resistance. Dr. Berenbaum will be in conversation with critically acclaimed film director, Julia Mintz, who just released the documentary Four Winters. If you would like to join us for the next two lectures, you may register at the link in the chat. Before we begin, I'd like to extend a special thank you to the Greater Miami Jewish Federation, the Florida Department of Education, the City of Miami Beach Cultural Affairs Program, Cultural Arts Council, and the State of Florida Department of State Division of Arts and Culture and Culture, uh, sorry, and Florida Council on Arts and Culture for all their help and support in making this lecture series possible. So it is now my pleasure to introduce a good friend of the Holocaust Memorial, Dr. Michael Berenbaum. Dr. Berenbaum is a writer, lecturer, and teacher who consults in the conceptual development of museums and the development of historical films on the Holocaust. Currently, he is the director of the Ziggy Zierig Institute and professor of Jewish studies at the American Jewish University. He's also the author and editor of 20 books, uh, scores of scholarly articles, and hundreds of journalistic pieces. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Michael. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nikki, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me tell you what we're gonna do tonight. Uh, Nikki's given you an overview of the um, three-part series. Uh, Zoe Waxman will present the general issues associated with studying um, women in the Holocaust, and we are gonna have a, a little bit of a very different experience with uh, Julia Mintz, who's just done a, um, wonderful a movie that has uh, played in Boca, I'm not sure it's come down uh, to Miami, called War Four Winters about partisan fighters, but she features in that, um, she features in that um, women partisans in particular, including uh, women who use their camera as a form of resistance, which was resistance as documentation and the like. I'm gonna also suggest that you ask um, questions in the chat and as part of our normal give and take of conversation, I'll be happy to include those questions in what I say. And at some point, uh, you know, uh, about three quarters of the way through uh, the afternoon or, or for you the evening, we will turn and take uh, questions uh, from you and uh, direct it. Let me begin by talking a little bit about the belated way in which we came to study women in the Holocaust. This is um, in the late 1970s, as the women's movement uh, was gaining strength, uh, a group of um, women suggested that we have something unique to study in the experience of women during the Holocaust. That meant with enormous resistance on the part of um, some scholars. And the resistance on the part of some scholars was the argument that women were not killed as women in the Holocaust. They were targeted and killed as Jews in the Holocaust. And therefore to differentiate the experience of women from the rest of the experience of the Holocaust was to do injustice to the way in which they were victimized and the reason for which they were victimized. And that for a period of time was enormously tense um, element in the discussions of, um, of Holocaust scholars. Tense because people were trying to understand the event and they felt that going in this direction was an improper uh, way. And the other thing that happened is that um, some people wanted to study this material in order to, as it were, enhance their uh, study of feminism uh, and see it as a tool for 
understanding uh, the women's issue in the extreme. Over time, a really genuine understanding has developed in which we have to look at some parts of the experience in a very deep and profound way, not only um, by differentiating the experience of women and men, but showing us in certain respects how the experience of women was different and how that is a, an enormous part of the story of the Holocaust and can't be overlooked. So in one sense, you can say that we've reached the modus vivendi in which everybody now accepts that there is something unique to study about uh, the experience of women and that we have to understand what was unique about the study of women. And in recent years, you've also had a very interesting addition to it because we now study women perpetrators as well as women victims. And that becomes another way of understanding and throwing a particular lens on the Holocaust. Let's begin with a very basic um, understand. And, and by the way, um, in one sense, um, some ordinary feminists would say, how the hell can I understand the woman's experience? And my answer to that is very simply that I'm trying to understand the Holocaust and therefore I try to understand everybody's experience within the Holocaust. And I'm speaking um, generally and in very important ways about what we understand about the Holocaust by throwing a particular lens on the experience of women. Let's uh, begin in a very basic way by saying there were more women victims of the Holocaust than men. How do we document that and how do we um, prove that? Let's give uh, three very simple examples immediately. Uh, the first is that um, in the early years of the unfolding of the killing process, most especially after the German invasion of Poland and the, um, uh, the aftermath, the assumption was that um, the Germans being a quotation marks civilized people would not attack uh, women and children and men would be most vulnerable. Consequently, there were any number of men who escaped leaving behind their wives and their children. And consequently, um, any number of um, people report dramatically that their fathers escaped and women and children were left behind. Um, Nicole announced that I am a, a, a head of the Ziggy Ziering Institute. Ziggy Ziering was a young child whose father escaped to England, presuming that he might be in danger for both his prominence and his political views. And he left behind his mother and his two sons. And the mother was responsible for the fate of the two sons, including their deportation to um, Riga and their incarceration in Kaiserwald. And their father through no fault of his own, but through a faulty assumption that they would not target women and children, ended up living in safety in England as his wife and his two sons were victimized. The second example of um, the over-representation of women in the um, victim category in terms of being murdered is all, uh, all of you know that at Auschwitz, there was a selection. The selection was that men went to one side, women and children to the other. They lined up in groups of five and it was inevitable that the children, young children stayed with their mothers. And it was almost inevitable uh, and almost routine that uh, when the selection took place and women with children were sent to the death, it was women and not, uh, not men who were overrepresented in that group. They may have had boys or girls, but essentially it was women and children. 
because um, uh, husbands uh, were sent with the men and being sent with the men meant that they had the prospect of, of, of uh, living. If you want in a concrete example of that, Elie Wiesel, what? Elie Wiesel arrives in Auschwitz on Schwot, 1944. His mother and his young sister Tsipora are sent, seven years old, are sent to their death. He and his father survive. His older two sisters also survive. His father survives until what? Until the death marches in which he's victimized. His older two sisters survive, but his mother and Tsipora are immediately sent to their death. So in the Wiesel family of five, three men and uh, two men and three women, the two people who died who were murdered were mother and child in a natural way. You also have the unique, uh, sometimes the very interesting experience. I, I will give you uh, two examples that came from some work I did today. Uh, one is that upon arrival in Auschwitz, um, some grandmothers who intuited what was about to happen um, made a fateful uh, request. They asked their daughters, they said, leave your child with me. They're gonna treat older women better if children with them. And therefore the grandmother and the child were sent to their death. And the mother survived never imagining that she was abandoning her daughter or child, son or daughter to death. But uh, thinking for a moment that um, she was doing her mother a favor. And again, had to survive with the knowledge that her mother essentially uh, maybe in innocence, but more likely with an intuition intuition of what happened chose in very real respects to go what to go to her death with the child or children. Uh, the second example happened today in which um, a woman um, saw her sister and her two children arrive at um, a Birkenau and had the uh, capacity to have someone ask her sister to step out of the gas chamber. And that's a complicated story. We don't have to go into that. So what happened is the mother stepped out, never imagining that she was abandoning their children to death. So we know that in a very real respect, we know in a very real respect, there were more women than men who were victims, and I can go through elements of the entire experience and begin to, um, uh, to demonstrate that as a fact. All of them were being killed as Jews, but women were murdered because of a number of things in greater numbers than men, not tremendously greater numbers, but significantly and measurable uh, um, um, uh, numbers. Let's take a uh, another aspect in which we have to uh, talk about, which is a place in which survivors give false testimony, not knowingly false testimony, but false testimony, which is one of the interesting things is to listen to women's testimony of the Holocaust. And um, many women say the Nazis put something in our food so we cease to menstruate. And all of you who have listened to testimony have heard that again and again and again. Uh, there is no evidence that the Nazis put anything in the um, food to uh, cease menstruation. We now know that in essence, um, what shall we say? In essence, tension and malnutrition uh, make it so that women do not menstruate. Uh, a very simple example in ordinary life is that marathon women, uh, marathon runners and marathon women very often cease to menstruate because of the extreme to which they push their own bodies. Now that ended up being a peculiar blessing to women in concentration camps because they had no capacity 
to deal with, um, to keep clean under these circumstances. And it also meant something very different after the war in terms of the recovery process, because many women, when they recovered and they keep using the line over and over again, I was a woman once again. And being a woman once again, many of them also therefore married and decided to get pregnant precisely because of the fear that they would not be able to have children. And consequently, the issue became a very peculiar one. Women played a very unique role and a very important role in resistance. And they had a problematic role in resistance, but also a very important role in resistance, which is that women were very um, essential as uh, couriers between ghettos and passing on information. Essentially, if you had a blonde haired, blue eyed woman, you would ask her to be the courier between uh, ghettos, especially if she, post if she spoke Polish with an unaccented, in an unaccented way. And we'll explain why that, that, not only why it was important, but why that was sometimes very unusual. If she spoke the native language in an unaccented way, she could get away with being a courier because there was nothing physical about her or her appearance that could demonstrate that she was Jewish. And one of the reasons Jewish stars were used is because Jews can't be, as it were, identified by the way, necessarily by the way in which they look. Therefore, you had to mark them. And unlike, for example, the eyes of Asian uh, people, the color of uh, African-Americans, et cetera, et cetera. So Jews were marked. It was symbolization to mark to the Jews for annihilation. And Jewish men had a deep and profound handicap because if they were asked ever to lower their trousers, if they asked uh, to lower their trousers, they had the mark of the Brit Milah. And that meant that they were in danger then. They were also in danger in other circumstances. Uh, for example, they were in danger if they went to the bathroom and they tried to go to the uh, bathroom in a way that was private because their penises appeared differently than the general penises of the uncircumcised population. And that would be a giveaway in a dramatic way. Uh, they, for example, uh, any number of people who lived as non-Jews on the outside would not get involved in any relationship with a woman because that would yield to a situation in which if intimacy resulted, they would be known to be Jewish, but Jewish women could, could serve an important function as couriers in resistance. And Jewish women also had one other advantage, especially in Poland, because in Poland, it, uh, among religious families, Orthodox Jews sent their boys to Cheder and to Yeshiva, and very often they sent their girls to public schools. And any number of girls will describe, uh, women today will describe how as girls, they went to school six days a week. And on Sabbath, they would not write because they were religious. That meant that they had greater skill than their brothers in a combination of two things in speaking the native language and also in speaking the native language without an accent and also had a greater um, chance of some um, friendships and knowledge of how the non-Jewish world functioned where their brothers who were in Cheder and Yeshiva and barely had those contacts did not. So the woman experience was different. We also have um, a tremendous amount of literature being developed over the last 10 years on a subject that, um, that um, uh, makes lots of people uncomfortable, uh, and that is sexual violation of women during the Holocaust, and also not only sexual violation of women during the Holocaust, but we know that some women 
were used um, as sex slaves um, uh, by the Nazis in a series of brothels. We also uh, know that there were some Nazis who had intimate relations with Jewish women that were used for um, by the Jewish women to save certain people within the camp itself. And in the case that I just spoke of, one of the reasons this woman was able to um, get her sister out of the um, crematoria was that she had had an intimate relationship with what, with a um, Nazi official. I'm not judging them. I'm merely saying that such events took place. And uh, I'll tell you a, a beautiful story um, in the aftermath of the war told by um, uh, the late Rabbi Arthur Hertzberg. He was the rabbi in Nashville, Tennessee uh, after the war and a survivor couple came to him uh, to prepare for their marriage. After the man left, the survivor um, woman said to the rabbi, I can't get married. And she lifted up her um, sweater and revealed that she had a tattoo between her breasts, which was the mark of someone who had been used as a sex slave, abused as a sex slave by, uh, by the Nazis. And um, consequently, she said, you can't uh, uh, marry me. And she also uh, ironically misstated that she could not be buried in a Jewish cemetery because there was the feeling that someone who was tattooed could not be buried in a Jewish cemetery. Not, it's not a true statement, not a religious requirement. And Rabbi Hertzberg um, um, indicated after he got over the absolute shock of that moment, said to her something and he said, uh, there's probably nothing more important I, I, I did on a human level in my rabbinate than doing this. He said, I said, not only will I marry you, but I'm going to put on the ketuba, the tulta, da, which means virgin. And there's no reason for you to feel guilty. And if you want, I will be happy to speak to your intended husband. Happy I will be. Uh, I would be honored to speak to your intended husband and to say why that should not count whatsoever. But that's an example of tremendous amount of sexual abuse that took place during the Holocaust. We have uh, recently had the counter testimony, which is also a very interesting piece of counter testimony, uh, which is, um, uh, a book that has um, recently come out, Love When There Is No Tomorrow. And the book, Love When There Is Tom No Tomorrow, is the story, I think, of 10 or 12 women who um, had loving relationships during the Holocaust with men whom they ultimately married. But the idea was that, that with no tomorrow, all they had was love. And all they had was the ability to uh, what? To live in the moment and to appreciate uh, each other, which is the counter testimony to sexual abuse. It's the counter testimony to, um, to that because it means that young people in the most difficult of circumstances found a way to find love. And many of these uh, were marriages that were forged under the worst imaginable circumstances and did something quite remarkable for um, both, part, uh, both parties. And it is the counter testimony. And if you think of it, what you, um, and, and, and uh, an interesting statement um, made by a um, religious woman who said, you know, the normal thing about courting and dating is in my community is that you wait until you're married. What happens when you don't know that you have tomorrow? 
what do you do? And what is it that you can imagine and the like? There's a, a wonderful story by Vlad Gamid who serves a couple of functions for us. Vlad Gamid was a uh, courier who bought arms for the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And Vodka even tells, Vodka was a redheaded woman who spoke Polish natively uh, and without an accent uh, and uh, uh, a rather uh, lovely, uh, uh, lovely, uh, beautiful woman uh, and uh, dealt on the Aryan side, lived on the, uh, on the Aryan side uh, with, um, uh, with, as an arms merchant, buying weapons for the um, uh, Warsaw Ghetto. She described her courtship in the following way. She had a young man who was interested in her who later became her husband. And she said the following, she said, you can be my boyfriend because I'm going somewhere and I don't know if I will return. I can't tell you where I'm going. My mother and father and brother are dead. And if I don't come back, I want someone to miss me. She then ends up going out and, and spending the night with the man who became her husband. And her mother-in-law-to-be, who's a religious woman, takes off her wedding ring and says to her son, give this to Vlatka, actually uh, to Feigala. Her name, her nom de, nom de guerre was, was, was Vlatka. Her, native, uh, her, her actual name was Feigala give this to Feigala, and she lifted a glass of water, and she said, Nyerish sold zain mit mazel. They didn't have a rabbi, they didn't have a chuppah, they didn't have a wedding, but she had a ring, and her mother-in-law's blessing is, let it be with luck. They ended up uh, not only marrying, but uh, marrying three times, but they ended up also living together for marriage that was some 60 years uh, of time and a very basic way that speaks of what is it with love when there is no tomorrow. Now let's go to the experience in the camps. Um, and and uh, well, let me also say one more thing about, about um, uh, sexual um, abuse and, and the like, um, which is we can call it sexual abuse, we can call it something else. And that is, there was a tremendous phenomenon in the um, partisans of um, a woman had, uh, the, the men were fighters. And when they came back, they expected the rewards of women. And consequently, the women had to pair off with a man for protection. Otherwise, they were regarded as fair game by any, any man who came back from battle. This was not non-Jews who were using women as their reward, but this were Jewish men using women as their reward. And that also created a very unique situation and sometimes a very problematic situation in which couples paired off who would have never paired off and never been with each other under normal circumstances by virtue of class, by virtue of language, by virtue of, of, of anything else. Uh, and consequently, uh, some of those ultimately became marriages and some of those only worked for the wartime situation and for the protection it afforded a woman from being regarded as uh, sexual rewards for the fighters uh, and uh, one of the very interesting things in, in um, Julia's film is um, one woman who says with a cute smile on her face, uh, you know, they say that uh, there was no uh, woman partisan who remained a virgin. My husband didn't believe when we got married that I was a virgin. And then she says with a twinkle in, in her eyes saying, but I was a virgin, unbelievable, but very important. Let's now go into the camps and talk about the camps in a very basic way. 
if you listen very carefully, uh, let's let's begin by saying concentration camps develop their own language. Primo Levi says in his book that we use hunger and it means I missed a meal. They use hunger and it meant they ate in 1941 and they ate again in 1945. And between 1941 and 1945, they were hungry every hour of every day. And in an interesting way, we see a physical re remnant of that hunger. And this is in anticipation of Passover, which is coming up. What is the first ritual we do on Passover at the table? We break the middle matzah. And we hide the middle matzah, the larger piece of the middle matzah, till the end of the meal. Right? We normally have, we, those of us who have Passover seders, which is probably most of us at this point, also remember this is where the kids go, what? Looking for the afikoman, you normally give them a gift. You hide it, it's hide and seek, it keeps them awake through the second half of the seder. That is normally regarded as our table as cute. But that's the deepest memory we have of slavery. Because if you don't know where your next meal is coming from, with every piece of bread that you get, you have to make a decision. Do I eat it now in its entirety and become less hungry? Or do I save a little bit of bread for later when I'm more, even more desperate than I am right now? And consequently, the slave breaks off the larger piece of bread and hides it in order to what? To have food when they are more desperate, when after their work, when they're hungrier, when they're more in need of it all. And when you go to Passover Seder and you, bake, you break that matzah, let your children and grandchildren think it's cute. And you remember that that's one of the ways in which you had to make a decision about very basic starvation. Let's now go to, um, um, to women in the camp cease menstruation and these, they, they develop their own particular vocabulary. We spoke about people who were hungry and because they were hungry, they got hungry and that hunger lasted five years. We speak also of people who got cold, they got cold in October and they got warm again in May and every moment of every day between October and May, they were fighting off a bitter cold. They had a testimony for someone called, a, they had a word that they developed called Musulmana. The Musulman was the person who had already given up on life who was the walking dead. And most survivors with their honest testimony will tell you that they avoided the Muslimana. The Muslimana became taboo. They avoided the Muslimana not because they were cruel and not because they were, um, uh, they were, they were um, uh, indifferent, but because they understood that the balance between life and giving up life was a thin reed. And they were afraid that the closer they got to the Muslimana, the more they might become the Muslimana. So when women developed, uh, women developed uh, an interesting vocabulary of their own. And one of the things they speak about is something called Lagashvestus, Camp Sisters. Now Camp Sisters means that the moment you lost your entire family, you developed an intense friendship with one or two or three women. And by the way, it very often reflected something very interesting, which is if you had one sibling, you developed a friendship with one person. If you had two siblings, you developed a friendship with two siblings, with two people as your camp sisters. And if you had uh, three siblings, you developed it very often with three, which tells you that you mirrored, as it were, the support mechanism that you received at home. 
By the way, the support mechanism, but let's not, let's not uh, exaggerate. Some of us fight like tooth and dog with our siblings, right? We've all had uh, either us doing it or our kids doing it. But the interesting thing is how do you unite, how do you unite the siblings? Unite the siblings when someone from the outside threatens them and they then discover what? Their real bonds. So Camp Schwester's became a phenomenon of intense protective friendships, so mutually supportive friendships that developed among women. No comparable language developed out of the vocabulary of men. They spoke about friendships, but they didn't use the next thing, which is the bonding that becomes the bonding of siblings and all that that, all that, that involved. And in fact, um, sometimes when they spoke of friendship, there's a, um, a very deep, uh, deeply honest um, memoir by a man by the name of George Salton called the 23rd Psalm. And he develops a, a beautiful story about his friend Ernesto. And how do I know it's a deeply honest testimony? Because at the end of his discussion of Ernesto, he said, I'm happy that situations never became so desperate that I had to steal Ernesto's shoes. Let me repeat that because it strikes you as unusual. He was my best friend. We trusted each other completely, but I was happy that the situation never was so desperate that I had to steal my best friend's shoes, which meant that at some level he was telling you that in the, when push came to shove, it was survival of the fittest. No overall, no comparable discussion emerges among women who then speak of sisters and the bond of sisterhood, which meant mutual protection and mutual help. It meant that they were able to reach out to each other and to mutually support each other and to pull each other through. And they had a much greater form of community amidst oppression than men did. Now I'm going to leave it to you folks to draw your conclusions as to all that that means. But I think that that might be deeply reflective of a larger trend in terms of the nature of friendships between men and women, between men and men and women and women, and a sense of being bond as if you were sisters in a very deep way without ironically the same rivalry that men think of between brothers. And that becomes a very important phenomenon in the camps. It becomes something that was deeply identifiable in the camps in a very basic way. Let me talk about one unique experience in the camps that um, happened that I began to understood, understand it absolutely accidentally. About almost 30 years ago, a woman walked into my uh, office at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum with an old manila envelope. Open the vanilla envelope and what is it? The vanilla envelope was essentially a series of recipes. I asked, what is this? She said, let me tell you a story. There's a woman by the name of Minna Pachter who died on Yom Kippur in 1944 in Tresenstein. Before she died, she gave this envelope to a woman who looked like she was in better shape. And she said, uh, if you survive, give this envelope to my daughter 
Anna Stern in Palestine. The woman arrives, survives, arrives in Palestine. She does not meet an Anna Stern of Prague in Palestine. 23 years later, she's at a party in 1967 in New York. She meets Anna Stern, who was then in New York, who had lived in Palestine during the war and who was a Czech immigrant. And she says to her, and if you don't have chills after this, she says to her, I have a gift for you from your mother. She opens up the gift. What is the gift? The gift is a series of recipes that the women of Trezenstadt compiled, which Minapactor saved. Uh, and essentially what it meant is that the way they dealt with starvation was to write down recipes of when they had a home and a table, a family and food. And they wrote down, and what is the material culture of Central European women? One of the elements of material culture of Central European women was food. Turned out, we had a, uh, a woman who just died, Cara da Silva, who tried all of these recipes and she discovered something very interesting, that something was missing in the recipes. Now, the something was missing had two possible interpretations. Either women are not fully honest about giving up their recipes, which is sometimes true. Or the second thing is you actually need a kitchen to write down your recipes. You can't do it without what? Without the actual thing in front of you. We published the cookbook and I had a, um, uh, a brilliant, mar the cookbook is called In Memories Kitchen. It's still available. I had a um, unusual, uh, brilliant marketing uh, device. I said, I don't want you to buy it unless you make two promises to me from this cookbook. One is that you will tell the story of the women who did this cookbook. And then you'll do a second thing, which is you'll only make it for a happy occasion. They, sur they, su they suffered enough and I want them around your table on joyous occasions, a wedding, a bris, a bar mitzvah, a birthday, an anniversary, when your family is around you and you can do this. Published cookbook, cookbook did exceptionally well because I didn't realize it, but people buy cookbooks for their daughters, for their daughter-in-laws, for their, their nieces, for their uh, 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 granddaughters, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden, the Holocaust Museum was flooded with other cookbooks compiled under identical circumstances. A little bit of a less dramatic story because they didn't, wasn't reunited with the intended recipient 23 years after her mother's death. But it turned out that one of the things women did together, even in Auschwitz, where they had a struggle for pen and paper and keep it, one of the things they did was to preserve their own material culture. 20 years go by and I get a call from a French documentary filmmaker who turns out that she is doing a documentary on cookbooks done in death camps, concentration camps, gulags in Cuba, in the Soviet Union, in China, in a variety of circumstances. And one of the very interesting ways that women coped with their own starvation was to recreate in the imagination the days when they had tables filled with people, when they were cooking for them and celebrating and all of the joyous occasions that people came back to. And that was a universal phenomenon of gulags and prisons and concentration camps and death camps in a variety of different cultures and says something deep and profound 
about how women coped with their own situation. Let me now take you um, one more um, dimension, then we'll answer some questions. Let's talk about recovery after the war. Many, um, let's, let me put it to you in a, in a historical um, uh, analogy, which speaks about rebirth, rejuvenation, and everything else. In post-war Europe, the largest birth rate was in the DP camps. And if you look at pictures of Bergen-Belsen, what you see is you see baby carriages in whatever decrepit condition they are in, Bergen-Belsen after the war, the, the DP camp, and women who are pregnant. Meaning that something profound, and if you think of the age of the oldest children of survivors, they're all born in 46, in late 45, 46, and 47, which meant that the response to death was ironically to recreate life. Sometimes it was done because they wanted to touch innocent life. In the Jewish sense, innocent life is not the way we're gonna use it in the abortion debate. Innocent life is an infant. And they wanted in the words of many survivors, and you hear this echoed throughout, they wanted someone they could love who would love them back. And if you hold a little baby in your arms, what do you feel with a little baby in your arms? You feel, and if it's yours especially, you feel what? virtually unconditional love. And when that child is resting in your arms, you feel what? You feel enveloped with that love. If I walk in with my, uh, um, my uh, years ago, my teenage children, I say, good evening, they would say, mm. uh, if I walk in with, uh, when they were infants, they would run and greet me at the door and they would jump into my arms. So people felt the desperate need to love. They also felt the desperate need to be in their terms, and I'm listening to testimony, to be women again. And women again in that sense, which was very important, was to be able to give birth and bring life into the world. Um, and uh, consequently, you have the rebuilding of the Jewish people in the immediate post-war era in a way that is unexpected and almost unimaginable because nobody knew where they were gonna live, nobody knew where they were gonna go, nobody knew what their future would bring. They didn't know where they were headed to, whether Israel would be created, whether they were headed to Palestine, to the United States, to Argentina, to Brazil, to any country imaginable. And they dared, to bring children into that in uncertain world out of a combination of the need to be nearer innocent life, the desperation, loneliness to love something and someone who was innocent. And by the way, if they married fellow survivors, everybody had shadows behind them and all sorts of horrific memories. And last thing I wanna say on this um, is they did something else which is astounding. Many years ago, I interviewed a man by the name of Rabbi Arnold Weider. Arnold Weider was the mole in Boston, the ritual circumciser in Boston. And um, because Boston loves the New York Yankees so much, he had the nickname, if you're baseball fans, he had the nickname of the Yankee Clipper with no apologies to Joe DiMaggio. And um, I asked him, where did you learn to be a mole? And he said, I learned to be a mole in Bergen-Belsen. And I picked up for a moment on something astounding. In 1946, Jewish men and women dared to circumcise their sons after six years in which lowering the trousers of male was a death sentence 
not knowing where they would live and what they would do and where they would be and what the world was going to be like. They dared to make an indelible mark on their sons of the covenant of the Jewish people, not only religious Jews, but secular Jews who were furious at God. People had given up all idea of religion. They dared to circumcise their sons, and they also dared to circumcise the boys who were not circumcised between 1942 and 1945. And Rabbi Weider spoke about this happening in as a phenomenon, which tells you something about the issue of rebirth, and not only the rebirth of life, but the rebirth of I'd even say defiant Jewish life. And it's an astounding, it's an astounding phenomenon. Folks, I'd like to take some questions from you. We have a little bit of time left, but that's a general background. But when you hear the unique vocabulary of Camp Sisters, and you have no comparable vocabulary for men, you see something about the camaraderie and the mutual trust that developed in camps between sisters, which was essential to their survival. Any questions, please put them in the chat, or even you can raise your hand and ask them and we'll take some questions all the way through. Thank you. Did camp sisters tell you if they continued their relationships for life? Uh, Arian, it's a, that's an interesting question. They, um, not only did some continue their relationships through life, but even if the relationships were interrupted, when they met each other again, they were sisters again. And that is that people ended up going to different countries and different places but they essentially had gone through an experience together that was so binding and so intense and the like that they experienced it again. Did they adopt the children of each other if any of the sisters died? The very interesting question is, you're, you're presuming a, a normal world in which kids survive. During the camps, most kids did not survive. The children who survived were very, very, very rare. And in the post-war world, the question became, if you, uh, and, and look, I, I faced this when I was a single parent. The most awesome question you have um, if you're in a normal world, if you're a single parent is if something happens to me, what happens to my children? And who is it in the world that you trust with your children? And by the way, that creates enormous problems in families sometimes where a sibling would explain. These women trusted each other with everything they have and all that they were. And consequently, the, um, the depth of that is very, very important. I'm asked a question about hidden children, and I think it's a very important question. Let me talk about that as also as part of the women's experience. You all know the story of the kinder transport. The kinder transport are the children from, um, in, uh, from uh, Germany, that which then included Austrian parts of Czechoslovakia, who were sent to England in 1938 and 39. Now you have to ask yourself a question. How do you love a child so much and understand how grim your situation is to say the only way to save my child is to give them away? And once you begin to understand that, you begin to understand what it meant. And then for, and I spoke about this yesterday under a different circumstances, the 
children who were sent to England, despite, even as adults, despite knowing that their parents sent them to save them, still feel that their parents abandoned them. Psychologically, logically, they understand my mother and my father made this incredible decision to save me. And psychologically, if you hear them talk two minutes later, my parents abandoned me. There's a wonderful film, which you should see at some point with your children and some of you with your grandchildren called Into the Arms of Strangers, which is the story of the hidden children. And the reason you see it with your children is because the first thing you want to do after you see that film is to hug your children and your grandchildren and hug you, and they want to hug you because it's the story about the parents who made that decision. There's a moment in that film in which a um, woman describes her experience as a girl. My father took me off the train at the last moment. And I ended up in five concentration camps and I never forgave him until I became a mother. In other words, I couldn't forgive him because of what happened to me. Then I understood as a father how you love a child and why someone would dare to grab a child. Now, let's go with hidden children also in the second time. Children in, you had to, again, find someone who would take your child from you and whom you trusted with your, the life of your child. That meant, again, you had to face the ultimate decision. I'm not capable of protecting my child. I'm not capable of protecting my child. And somebody else has to take that child. Now, the intriguing thing in both cases is after the war, some stories of reunion were wonderful. And many stories of reunion were difficult because these had, what? These had um, the kids who left at nine years old were 16 and 17. When they came back, their parents were different and they were different. And their parents knew how to relate to a nine year old, not to a 17 year old who'd been independent for nine years, for six years or seven years. The same way Abe Foxman, for example, who was a hidden child his parents had to kidnap him from his nanny. And she said directly, I saved this child, he now belongs to me. And in some cases, I had a friend who wrote about the story, which was um, uh, magnificent. Her biological, she was uh, sent in um, uh, away in Poland her biological mother survived the war and they agreed that there would be a transitional period. So a biological mother started to, let's call her a mother, started visiting. And then she started staying over at her biological mother's home. And then only after a long period of time did the transition take place in which gradually she stayed at her mother or biological mother's home and only occasionally went to visit her adopted mother's home because the transition was a climactic, very difficult um, um, uh, decision. Um, you said that there are tension and malnutrition made women stop having their periods or there's specific types of tension that made women stop having their period. I am not a physician. And though as a single parent, I had to explain menstruation to my daughter because unfortunately I was not dating at that point. And I learned from um, uh, the most important line on that. I learned from the um, uh, TV show Mad Men, which is um, the, the, um, the stepmother told her stepdaughter if you run into any problems, go to any adult woman, she'll know what to do. 
and I was not smart enough to say that at that point, but I say it because, uh, and let me tell you something that was, when he, they said that on, on, on the, on the uh, TV show, I made my daughter watch it and she started laughing and laughing and laughing. She said, why couldn't you have told me that at that, at that point as, as well? Uh, I don't know why women stopped menstruating. I can only tell you that it was an incredible blessing that for all horrific reasons that they did because there was no way in which they could have kept themselves in any way in the circumstances of the camp. And again, you have to understand the woman's experience, which the women who follow me will tell you, which is how abnormal that felt to a young woman. So they felt it was something happening to them, not something their body was doing of its own case. And in that sense, their body was what protecting them in a very uh, deep way. And uh, somebody writes, in my survivor's family, we had an adoption upwards. My female cousin from Lithuania had a newborn toward the end of the war and adopted an older woman who had lost her entire family. My cousin had lost her parents, put her newborn into the older woman's hand, cared for, cared, called her Safta, grandmother, and took the older woman, now grandma to Israel with her and her husband and kept the family together for the rest of their lives. And that again is people made things, they made a new life for themselves and the life did not follow the type of life that we had, which is a normal, natural life without many of the same tensions, thank God. And consequently, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a grandfather. I have my grandchildren. My kids have not had to, sort, ha had to seek another grandfather. Um, uh, and again, but we all in life also develop people who become, um, as it were, part of our family in a very deep way. And those of us who are of a certain generation where we never called people, older people by their first name and many people in our family who are uncle and aunt, uh, where now three-year-olds will call me Michael and, uh, you know, and the like. They were never in our family. We were never allowed to call people our senior uh, anything other than Mr. and Mrs. And they then became uncle and aunt when they were very close. And it took me a long time to figure out who was a real uncle and who was a real aunt in that let me tell one, one more uh, medical uh, opinion. Malnutrition and point of starvation cause cessation of menses. That's said by a doctor and uh, makes, uh, a good deal of, makes a good deal of sense. And again, um, in a film I just saw today, the woman uh, had her period after the war and she said, I now felt like a woman again. And in that sense, um, uh, the, that's the return of life, the return of biological function, which became, uh, which became very important. Let me tell one more story then, if there are any other questions, we'll take them. Um, there's a woman in this community uh, by the name of um, um, Natalie Weinstein, who tells the story that um, her father, against her mother's wishes, gave her uh, away in the following way. He put her on the um, steps of a police station in a small town in Poland, stayed hide hidden, and found that they gave his daughter to a uh, convent. Police couldn't take care of it, gave the daughter to a convent. And um, he told the story, which is enormously powerful. He said, my wife, even though she know I knew I saved the daughter, was never intimate with me again. After the war, his wife did not survive the war. After the war, he had a bicycle and he went from convent to convent to convent to convent seeking to find his daughter. He found a girl 
who is now five instead of one and a half, who roughly resembled his daughter, what his daughter might have looked um, like. And the nuns said, how are you going to know her? And he was that very rare Polish man, Polish Jewish man who had diapered his daughter. And she, he said, she has a birthmark on her right thigh. And so she did. And he said he was rewarded for doing something that most Polish men, Jewish men did not do at that time of diapering his daughter and therefore was able to identify her in a way that would not have normally been accessible to him. So he said, God gave me back her life because I had done that deed. And uh, he lived to be a hundred. She's now in her, um, in her uh, 80s and father and daughter were reunited and uh, lived in love with each other. Last question, did siblings adoption of the camp's uh, hidden surviving siblings us? Uh, did the siblings adopt hidden, hidden surviving children of the camp sisters if one sibling didn't survive? Look, the question of what to do with children after the war, there were few children who survived. Um, and let me tell you the story again, because it happened last week and I'm still shaking from it. Somebody someday is going to say, um, who is the youngest survivor of Auschwitz? And there was a male child who was born on December 19th, 1944. In Auschwitz. And because the boy was too weak to cry, given the conditions of his mother, he was placed on a top bunk when his mother went out to work. And he survived from the 29th of December to the 16th of January when the Germans left the camp. So he lived 20, he lived 18 days in Auschwitz. Lived, no, no, yeah, 29th is, is uh, 2 is 31st, and 16, he lived 18 days in Auschwitz and was saved by the fact that he was too weak to cry. And he essentially is the youngest survivor of Auschwitz, is still alive today, 77 years after liberate, almost 78 years after, after um, actually 78 years after liberation. And he's the youngest survivor, but how children survive, that's the subject of another discussion. And we'll turn it back to Nikki. We will see you on the 20th of March and again on the 27th of March. And thank you very much for joining us.